More than 40 million Americans live in poverty today. 40 million. Today's guest looks at the way the poor and the homeless are portrayed in public life, and it doesn't match the reality he knows. He's Stephen Pimper, this week on Story in the Public Square. Welcome to Story in the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. I'm Jim Lutis from the Pell Center at Salve Regina University in historic Newport, Rhode Island. Alongside me, as he is every week, my friend and co-host G. Wayne Miller of the Providence Journal. Story in the Public Square is an effort to study, celebrate, and tell stories that matter. So each week we invite authors and scholars to help us understand how the stories we tell ourselves shape public life. This week we're joined by a scholar of poverty and how it's portrayed in popular culture. Stephen Pimper is a faculty member at the University of New Hampshire and author of a new book, Ghettos, Tramps, and Welfare Queens, Down and Out on the Silver Screen. Stephen, thank you so much for being with us this My week. My pleasure, glad to be here. So poverty is, you know, is, is found across human existence and uh, across history. Politicians today like to tell a story about why poverty exists. What is that story? Um, I mean, I think the story that gets told today is pretty much the story we've been telling in a lot of ways since the Middle Ages, and that is that if you are poor, it is through your own doing. And we've seen a couple of recent examples of this. Uh, Secretary of Housing and Urban Development Ben Carson uh, not long ago suggested that uh, people are poor because they don't have the right mindset, and that if they would simply sort of will themselves, if they would think more positively and exert themselves, if they would expend effort in order to lift themselves from poverty, that they have the power that they have the ability to do that themselves. A little bit before that, uh, Representative Chaffetz from Utah uh, suggested when, when uh, talking about uh, the then version of the Republican health reform bill that was going to radically increase costs for lots and lots of people, suggested that if simply people would refrain from buying a new iPhone, uh, that then they would be able to afford health care. Uh, and at some level, I, I give him the benefit of the doubt. I think that he believes that. I think that at some level there are an awful lot of people in power who really do believe this long-standing story of poverty as moral failure, as an act of irresponsibility that manifests itself in your economic state. But beyond having an, uh, people who are telling these stories, there's still an audience for these stories. Mm -hmm. Th these stories continue to resonate with some segment of the American public. Am I, am I right about yeah, that? Well, they, you know, it's, it's what's, what's fascinating and horrifying is that they resonate even with people who you think they might not resonate with. And that is, there's, there's a long line of research in sociology, uh, mostly in uh, anthropologists who do interviews with women on welfare, and this goes back at least to the 1980s. Uh, and I myself sort of have a background as a practitioner and worked in soup kitchens and food pantries and did a lot of, of anti-welfare reform activism in the 1990s before I went off to grad school. Uh, and some of the nastiest things Things that I have ever heard human beings say about welfare recipients have come out of the mouths of welfare recipients themselves. So why? Well, I mean, I think part of what's going on there is 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 that that they, like the rest of us, are suffused in the culture that we inhabit, and that is the story that we have been telling. I mean, at least in public form since Reagan in the 1960s, when he was running for governor, when he sort of first tell, started telling the story about the welfare cream, right? The idea that uh, that 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 there are these women, and they were always women and black women, even if that was not articulated out loud, who who are living off your tax dollars. And that act of exploitation was told as part of a story to explain to you, white working class voter, why you might be better off abandoning the Democratic Party, who is associated with those welfare programs, and shift to identifying yourself as a Republican. This is what was known as the Southern strategy. Mm -hmm. um, but an explicit effort to identify this sort of enemy living off the public dole, supposedly. Uh, and that story has been told over and over and over and over again by politicians of all stripe and politicians of both party, right? If we think about welfare reform in the 1990s, uh, that was champion 
championed by Bill Clinton, a Democrat who, in fact, uh, made that a cornerstone of his first presidential campaign in a belief that that was a way for him to pull some of those white working class voters back away from the Republicans into the Democratic Party again. So what is the root of the power of that story? You don't need to work in a soup kitchen and you don't need to work in a prison. You don't need to have a degree in sociology to know that people become poor or are poor for many, many different reasons. And most of them are certainly a lot of them not personal failings. There's right. mental illness. There's tragedy that befalls an individual in a family. There's substance abuse. There are many, many other factors. A casual look around you would say, that myth is a myth. When it, where's the power of that story? I mean, you're absolutely right. It endures and has for a very long time. You know, and, I, and I think that, that that casual look, first of all, looks different for different people. And that casual look for you may reveal that truth, but I'm not sure that it does for, for as many other people as you might wish. I think part of what's going on there is those kinds of stories, they serve a function. Uh, and, and part of it is, I think, a, a, a way in which we, as a country in some ways, have defended ourselves from some very uncomfortable truths. If we look around at other rich democracies on the planet, uh, we fare very poorly across a whole host of measures, right? We have uh, higher or highest, ri highest rates of poverty, of child poverty, of elderly poverty. We have higher infant mortality rates. We have lower life expectancy rates. We have uh, record levels of incarceration and of violent and crime. That list goes on and on and, and on. And much right? higher rates than many other Absolutely developed. Absolutely right. It's right? not just sort of, an incremental uh, difference. Very much an outlier. If you look at studies that, that seek to evaluate people's own self-satisfaction with their lives, with their happiness, we rank often toward the middle at best and often toward the, the bottom of those expenditures. And this is, I think, the most important piece of that. If you look at mobility from generation to generation and compare the United States, again, with other rich democracies, we do very, very poorly. And yet, that idea, right, that's it's at the very core of the story that we have told ourselves and told the world at least since the late 19th century and probably before that. So I think that part of what winds up happening is the realization that we are not who we tell ourselves we are, that this is not a land of opportunity for enormous number of people here, that to confront that and then think about what that means to our identity, right, to, to our identity as Americans, and then what that means in terms of policy. What do we do to change that? What do we do to fix that? I think that there is something about that that creates so much cognitive dissonance that these handy stories that say, no, 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 it's not government. Right? We don't. We don't need government to intervene. We don't need to to sort of, so, of 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 create different systems. People need to pull themselves up by their bootstraps and assume the power that they have within so, them. So, on a psychological level, then it's almost easier to live a lie or believe in a lie than to confront the truth. I mean, uh, it, it, it's you know. I, I mean, I I think that's plausible. Right, and it's not something I'm willing to say with certainty, but I think it's plausible. I think that's part of what's going on here and why these stories continue to resonate. The other thing I will say is they continue to resonate because we continue to tell those stories. And part of what I'm getting at in the book here is not just that these are stories that are told by politicians over and over again, but these are narratives that pop up over and over and over again in the popular culture and particularly in film. So we're getting it from all sides, right? So you may be hearing it from an elected official, position and authority, but even when you're going out for what you think might be an evening of entertainment, those kinds of narratives are being reinforced. And I think it becomes very difficult when you are so saturated in a, a very particular kind of viewpoint. I think it's very fewer of us than we would like to believe and, and you e are able to be outside of You that. even hear this in the locker room, at the lunch, lunch counter, in the gym. I mean, I hear this. And this everybody's kind of got talk. a story, right? I was in yeah. the grocery store. Oh, I was yeah. behind the line, right? Saw a woman with food stamps, despite the fact that yeah, food stamps don't exist buying, anymore. She was buying right? steaks. She was buying steak and steaks and, steaks and, and, all, and right? it becomes this, it's, steak and it's a folk tale, right? right it I mean, it's become tale. this, this, but it's so ingrained that those kinds of urban myths, people will swear that they really saw yeah. it, or they've got a friend who saw it, that they know that this happens. And breaking through that is, is difficult and complicated. Well, so you've described your scholarship as the history of poverty told from the perspective of poor people. Why is that perspective in particular so important? Um, 
Well, I mean, it's important for me in part because, as I mentioned earlier, I started out as a practitioner before I wound up becoming an academic. Um, and part of what uh, sent me back off to graduate school was that I was working um, throughout New York City, I was, I was running a technical assistance program uh, in a service that offered support for what were then only five to 600 soup kitchens and food pantries in the five boroughs. There are, I think, 1,700 now at last count. Um, and spending lots of my day out in the very poorest neighborhoods in the city, meeting people who are showing up in need of food. Uh, and this was, was sort of as the welfare reform debate of the 1990s was ramping up uh, and found uh, my own kind of cognitive dissonance, this disconnect with the people who I was meeting on the ground and what I was learning about their lives and their experience and the stories that were being told about them in the public sphere and trying to make sense of that. And uh, you know, for good or ill, decided that the path toward that was was advanced education and sort of immersing myself in in the literature to try to, to, to try to make sense of that. Um, so that's some of it is just selfish, was me trying to make sense of the world. Um, but I also think that, that because those narratives are so pervasive and they are so single-minded in lots of ways, that we wound up doing, we wind up doing a grave disservice to the extraordinarily large number of Americans who will experience poverty over the course of their lives and by not listening to them tell about their own experience to sharing their own experience of their lives and by using that as a way to generate somewhat public empathy as we think about what do we do with these policy issues. I mean, part of why welfare reform in the 1990s failed in, in my estimation is because none of the people affected by the program were a part of that discussion and a part of the process. So it was policy made by rich white men in Washington, D.C. with poor black women in the inner city in mind. And it is, I think, hardly surprising that there is a world of disconnect between the diagnosis and the solution. You use the word listen, yeah. which I think is a critical word in terms of storytelling and reading and listening to yeah. stories. Do we have a listening problem in America? It's a great question. I don't know that I've got a, a, a great answer to that off the top of my head. I mean, I think that, that, that what I know from the political psychology literature tells us that humans have a listening problem, right? That, that in some ways we are, are wired to react differently to information that confirms our worldview than to information that challenges. And maybe this is an evolutionary. Bias. Yeah, exactly, yeah. confirmation bias, right? Maybe this is an evolutionary defense mechanism, maybe. But it is hard for us to... Literally, it is literally hard for our brains to take in yeah. and process information that challenges those stories that sit at the core of who we are or, or how we think we belong to the world and, around us. And the way brains work when you're listening, many brains are automatically going to the response, not truly listening, not absorbing, but I've got a rebuttal to that or I know something different or truth or right. whatever. So what's the antidote to that? <laughs> Um, how do we fix everything? Um, well, not everything, but it's, 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 how, 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 it's how, it's, how do we just fix poverty? How do we fix yeah. poverty? Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, I, it's, it's the, the sort of the, the, the diagnosis I make in the book is looking at the history of film as one way to look at what's going on in the popular culture. Uh, sort of the large argument that I make is that we don't tend to show poor and homeless people on film too much at all. And when we do, we are not especially good at offering authentic portrayals of what that experience is. And more perniciously, those films, with exceptions to be sure, tend to reinforce those ugliest of stereotypes to wind up reinforcing that narrative. I think one way to think about cutting against that in just that particular area is for filmmakers to at least have a little bit more awareness of that. I mean, we've, we've finally gotten to the point where uh, the Academy Awards, when it comes time for nominations, are at least a little bit cognizant of the racial and gender makeup a lot of their awards categories, right? They're a little conscious of the fact when it's nothing but white men sitting around the table. I mean, that's really right? the last year we've seen that. But this is new. Yeah. Yeah. That's very right? new. I mean, that's yeah. really um, new in the last year or two. And still a long way to go in that regard. Yeah. 
But that is nowhere on anybody's radar if you're talking about poor people and homeless portray people and the way in which they are portrayed on screen. Right? There's no one on anywhere on anybody's radar to the best of a knowledge is sort of thinking about what are we doing in order to do a better job of bringing that experience into the movie theater or into your living room. Yeah. And I think that is not necessarily hard. I mean, it's, it's now uh, fairly standard practice for Hollywood filmmakers. If you're making a, a police movie or if you're making a movie about the military, you bring in usually retired police officers or retired military to come in as consultants, right? And show, you know, how do you hold the gun? How do you wear the uniform? How does the business of the precinct take place? Uh, out of some humility, right? There's a recognition of filmmakers there, right? That we don't know what this is, and we want to make it look good. Let's just take a quick moment for station identification. This is Story in the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. You can hear this program three times each weekend on Sirius XM Satellite Radio's Politics of the United States. That's the POTUS Channel 124. Rhode Island PBS in Providence, Rhode Island, is where the show is produced each week by a tremendous team of professionals. We're lucky to work with them. I'm Jim Lutis from the Pell Center at Salve Regina University. If you want to catch up with me on Twitter, I'm at JM Lutis. My co-host here is a talented author and award-winning journalist with the Providence Journal. G. Wayne Miller is tweeting to at G. Wayne Miller, all one word. And our guest this week is Stephen Pimper. He's a member of the faculty at the University of New Hampshire and the author of Ghettos, Tramps, and Welfare Queens, Down and Out on the Silver Screen. He's on Twitter too, at Stephen Pimper. So Stephen, um, you, we've talked a little bit about, about the book. Um, what in particular drove you to write this book, to th this look at the inter interplay between poverty and its popular portrayal on film? Uh, I mean, some of it was, was I was, I, uh, my second book is called uh, The People's History of Poverty in America, and that was an effort to uh, sort of retell the, the history of the American welfare state and the history of American poverty uh, from the perspective of poor and low-income people themselves, right? So instead of looking at what did LBJ have to say about the war on poverty, what can we find out about what some of the first recipients of those programs had to say about their own experience or about their own lives? Uh, and as part of, of sort of coming to the end of that project, I was looking for for uh, some work that had been done. I initially started looking at fiction, but was also looking at television and film, but wanting to see sort of if I could find something that was gonna give me a nice shorthand to what was going on in the larger popular culture at the time. And find my, found that, that I wasn't coming up with anything. Um, and that led, I think, relatively quickly to thinking about whether that was a project that made sense for me, despite the fact that I'm not a film guy. I mean, it's, it's my background is, is politics and policy and practice. It's not necessarily film, but it, it which, you know, I, I'm very cautious in the book of, of being clear that I'm not claiming to be a, 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 an expert on film per se, but I am, I think, uh, have some reasonable expertise in knowing something about the contemporary and historical experience of poverty and homelessness in the United States of America. So therefore, I'm able to judge the extent to which those portrayals match up with that kind of reality or what we know about and, the reality. And the, 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 your bottom line is that they largely don't. Yeah. Right? Are there, are there outliers? Are there gold there are. standard examples? Um, of there um there's a, a lovely movie from 1973 called Claudine uh, with a young James Earl Jones and Diane Carroll um, that uh, is about a single woman on welfare raising uh, four or five kids, I think. Um, and it is probably the single best representation of what we know of life under the old AFDC program as you are likely to encounter. Um, I mean, it really does talk about the, the way in which that program functioned when it actually hit the door of a poor family and, wow, and how it sort of altered their relationships with each other mm -hmm. and, you know, sort of, of James Earl Jones enters the picture and because of the rules of the program, they have to hide their relationship. It offers these wonderful portrayals of of the surveillance state in action, which in this instance was the social worker showing up uh, unannounced at all hours in order to monitor that poor family uh, and also to monitor the woman's sexual behavior, which was a key component of what went on in a lot of those states. Um, and it shows that in a way that I think captures what we know of that actual experience as well as you are likely to find. And they are fully rounded, three-dimensional, rich characters. 44 years ago. 
Yeah. Is the <laughs> so, so do you think that Hollywood, and I think by Hollywood I'm going to include the small screen in yep. addition to the large screen, has a, has a unique power in storytelling in American and indeed really in global culture. And, and just talk about that. I mean, it, 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 it's different, obviously, from journalism. It's different yep. from politics and other places where stories are told. Talk, talk about the unique position of, of Hollywood. I mean, I, I do think it's distinct. And this is something that, you know, that, that, that myself and other social scientists have struggled, struggled with. And, and um, I think there's a good argument to be made that we don't necessarily have the tools to get a good empirical handle on how do we quantify mm. that kind of influence and that kind of impact. And the, the, the hope initially in setting out for this book was that I was going to be able to, to generate at least something by way of, of metrics or standards to, to, to quantify and to trace out those kinds of effects. And I don't know that I wound up, I know that I didn't wind up in succeeding in doing precisely that. Uh, that said, we do have a large body of literature that both looks at how we process information from all sources and how that affects our behavior as political citizens. And there are also some really lovely discrete studies uh, 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 from political psychology and from psychology alone about, uh, and from communication studies about the effects of particular movies. Um, so it's, you know, a lot of this is sort of controlled experiment stuff. One group watches Roger and me, uh, one group doesn't. Uh, we then give them a body of questions mm. afterwards and see if they wind up with different kinds of perspectives on uh, corporate America or on. And what most of that research shows is that there are effects. They don't tend to be large and they don't tend to be long lasting. What we don't have is research that measures the cumulative effect over a lifetime of particular kinds of images. We've got a little bit of that that starts with looking at children and violence on television and what and I think pretty clear now that that has long lasting and probably permanent effects on their behavior, on likelihood of incarceration and all sorts of other factors. We don't have that too much for other factors, but it seems to me implausible that the way in which we walk through the world and the stories that we hear about other people in it do not shape the way that we come to make sense of the world we inhabit. Well, and if it doesn't, then this show doesn't have a period. <laughs> and then you guys so, got to get another line uh, of work. New idea. Um, <laughs> so we've, we've seen uh, race uh, yeah. return to the national dialogue uh, in, uh, return's probably not the right word, but it, it has Return a, to the elite, national dialogue yeah. coming out of the mouths of white people. Well, the, pretty much, yeah. Because <laughs> um, it has never left for large segments of the population. That's absolutely true. Right. But what I'm yeah. wondering is absolutely. whether or not there's a difference in the way poverty is depicted on film, if it's white poverty, and I'm thinking rural poverty, yep. versus urban African-American poverty. I mean, I think the answer is yes. Um, if you, again, look at, I look at, at just under 300 films over the course of, of American cinematic history. Uh, and, you know, among the patterns that I find is that if you are going to find poverty in the movies, it is disproportionately likely to be located in a big city in the Northeast, despite the fact that poverty rates are higher in the South and outside of metropolitan areas than they are inside of metropolitan areas, right? It's disproportionately likely to be a big city in the Northeast and disproportionately be portraying African Americans. Um, it's the overwhelming majority of, of those depictions. You do find portraits of white people living in poverty, and they tend to be overwhelmingly rural poverty. And the, the thing that is fascinating and troubling to me is that, and, and you know, sort of think about some, some, some recent movies, think about Winter's Bone, uh, think about uh, 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 I can't remember the name of it now, the, the, the woman who, who uh, joins up with a Native American woman and crosses over the Canadian border in order to bring refugees back. Um, I'll think of it when we go off air. Yeah. Um, uh, and uh, The Glass Castle just came out yeah. this past year. Marvelous um, film. We can argue about that. Uh, um, a lot of those are, Wendy and Lucy is another one, a lot of those are really rich, really thoughtful, really sympathetic portraits. Uh, Frozen River is the one that I couldn't think of. Um, 
that, that I think do a lot of the things that I've been complaining that movies don't. Now, those are disproportionately smaller independent films, right? But they really do sort of try to get inside those lives. There's a lot of sort of looking at the landscape. There's a lot of the, the camera showing you the lack of resources, showing you the distance to employment, to services, to support, to the kinds of things that would make it possible, right, for you to lift yourself up. I mean, there seems to be a real attention to try to explain to people that there are a lot of large social, economic, and geographic forces that constrain opportunity in these places. I don't think that it's coincidental that those positive portrayals are disproportionately white. So there, there is a dramatic transformation underway in Hollywood storytelling now. And that is a transformation, some would call it a revolution, in talent, in storytelling, migrating, moving from traditional film, traditional networks, to places like HBO and Netflix, of course, which cleaned up at the Emmys and Amazon. Th there's a shift of talent and storytelling. And some of the programming in those other venues are, are pretty spectacular. And they're tackling issues in a way that you never could or never have in the more traditional formats. Do you see hope in greater opportunities for storytelling in those new venues, such um, as Netflix? I always see hope because that's the only way I get through the day. <laughs> <laughs> because if it, if it doesn't, well, if you do need if hope at some today point to it doesn't get better, we are all yeah, in well, deep, I deep think trouble. I agree with that. Um, it's, you know, I don't, I, I, I haven't thought about sort of what's emerging. If you think about Netflix and Hulu and now the new CBS venture, right, yeah. that is now trying to sell you Star Trek in its it, new it's incarnation. It's stuff you just never saw um, yeah. traditionally. Correct. What now it's, it's, you know, and there are exceptions if you think about uh, uh, HBO going back to the corner and then more recently The Wire. Um, you've certainly got that sort of extended storytelling uh, that is making an effort to understand what is going on in those poor low-income communities. Um, the, the thing that gives me particular hope about that is, as a general rule, in terms of access, and who's, who's making decisions and who's making movies, television has been historically a little bit more open than film has. So you see a lot more women in front of the camera on television and a lot more women behind the camera on television than you do on film. Still a long way to go. Right, but there is there is a market dis difference now. What I don't know is how the political economy of television now is going to compare to film. Is it just going to reproduce sort of who's in charge of film, or will those spaces continue to open up to other voices, not just women, but people of color and people who who may be telling different sets of stories? And I think with more time available, maybe there's more space to do that. Well, unfortunately, we're out of time here, so we need to leave it there. Stephen Pompare, the book is Ghettos, Tramps, and Welfare Queens. Thank you so much for being with us. Whether you're watching or listening to the show at home or on the road, wherever you are, we want to thank you for being a part of Story in the Public Square. If you want to know more about what we're doing, you can find us on Twitter and Facebook or visit PellCenter.org. He's Wayne Miller. I'm Jim Lutis. We hope you'll join us again next time for more Story in the Public Square.